Hello, my name is Gerardo Blanco and I'm an associate professor and the academic director of the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College, United States. It is my pleasure to deliver this critical internationalization masterclass. The topic will be the marketization of international higher education. I think um, that this topic is of great importance and I hope I will be able to share some important insights and perspectives with each of you. It really has been uh, an area of great interest in our, um, in our uh, field um, to discuss whether market forces have an undue influence on the development of international higher education whether we as international educators and as professionals of higher education bear responsibility for some of the ethical challenges and questions that our field encounters, including at times the exploitation of international students, as well as understanding the very asymmetrical relationships that are rooted in issues of coloniality, of conquest, but also of an unequal global system of power and finance. However, I want to begin uh, with not the assumption that there has been um, some kind of golden age of international higher education. I want to begin my lecture today but po by pointing out the fact that um, there have been convergent forces in the work that we do within uh, international education today. Um, the first one is that both internationalization but also market forces have always already been part of uh, the landscape of higher education. In this sense, it's important to mention this first, uh, this first quote that comes from a very traditional history of the early universities uh, in the West. So this quote, as you can read, um, indicates that, quote, throughout the entire Middle Ages, there was a perpetual passing to and fro of masters and students from one country to another. And this is coming from the work of Compere um, since 1893, writing about this early history of universities. So we know that this global mobility of academics and of um, students has always been part uh, of um, universities since the Middle Ages, which um, by and large are considered to be sort of the mainstream, uh, mainstream beginnings of, uh, of our field of international education. From the same source, uh, this history of the early, um, early universities around the world, there is notion, there is this other quote uh, as well. The masters were, furthermore, dependent on the students from the payment of their honoraries. So I really wanted here to highlight the reality that in many, many cases, um, from the history uh, of the early universities, we are able to see um, not only how um, universities uh, are benefiting from this international mobility, these global flows of students, but also this is a great opportunity to remember how the university has always been entangled with um, some of these uh, realities that financial considerations uh, and financial influence have always been part of the history of universities. And I also want to um, next move on to, um, to this idea of how um, the marketization of universities today uh, in the context of international education um, really brings us right to this convergence of different and important phenomena. So in this sense, uh, I wanted to share this painting of Mary Antoinette 
wearing a muslin dress. Uh, and this will be important um, to mention, and, and I think it will have some uh, important considerations because this is not only an example of uh, cultural appropriation um, that has been long in the making, but it is also an example um, of how uh, coloniality, one of the many manifestations of coloniality, one of them being the fact that um, through the colonial process, right, through the process of colonization, local um, economies, local markets, one could say, have been uh, turned into monocultures. Uh, and I really wanted to illustrate this because the dress, uh, the particular technique to develop the dress that Marie Antoinette is wearing in this painting um, is quite common or was quite common across South Asia, particularly in Bangladesh, where I've had the privilege of conducting some work. Um, and that's exactly where I learned about this muslin uh, technique. So it is a form of cotton weaving that makes for very light uh, textures. However, the muslin um, industry in Bangladesh uh, and across South Asia was destroyed as part of the British colonization. And I think this really tells us something important. I think it prefigures a significant lesson to learn as we have a conversation about the marketization of international education, which is that um, these are not arbitrary processes, that these processes respond, yes, to economic interest, but they also respond to other interests as well. So I really wanted to highlight um, this point because I really think it suggests how um, the project of universities that we are so familiar with is committed to, is engaged and entangled with this notion of Eurocentrism, that coloniality and university cannot be separated in the majority world context, um, but also it speaks about uh, the need to reflect about how um, not all markets are the same and that when we talk about marketization of international education there is no turning back the clock and that's why in this initial part of my presentation I have focused so heavily on history but also it's important to highlight how and in what ways um, in particular right through what mechanisms um, is this process of marketization of international education operating. I also think uh, it is important to recognize that moving from past to present, we encounter uh, a reality in which universities today have become some form of global brands as much as they are um, higher learning um, spaces. Uh, or spaces that generate knowledge and research and so on. So I really think this is a very important consideration to have as we, um, as we go forward. It's very important to consider how um, many of these um, influences are affecting and transforming uh, higher education. I wanted to share how I started uh, becoming interested in this topic and why I believe uh, understanding processes of marketing and branding in higher education do not constitute a capitulation to um, neoliberal forces, but rather are a prerequisite if we want to engage uh, with the discourse of international education in a critical and compelling way. First of all, it's important to recognize that higher education institutions are part of a market or are part of a rather system of global competition and that universities are constantly trying to position themselves um, in advantageous ways so that first of all they can survive but that they can also um, but also in order 
to advance their, um, their goals and their different agendas. So I actually came to the topic of marketization and to the topic of marketing in higher education in a rather indirect way. I was very interested first and foremost in understanding processes of quality in higher education. And um, one of the early uh, um, articles that I wrote uh, was a spin-off from um, the topic right of uh, accreditation and quality and really understanding right this this research experience brought me into understanding the strategic ways in which universities um, display their quality emblems their um, their um, um, technologies or of technologies of proof as um, Lyotard would uh, refer to, um, and that is, in what ways do universities demonstrate that they are a good institution? And I found that in many cases, institutions pursue processes of assessment uh, or um, quality accreditation with the purpose of becoming more attractive in a market that is competitive. Um, I also um, became interested in the strategic use of brands. And some of my research right, has looked at how um, higher education institutions brand and rebrand themselves in order to attract students, but not only to attract students, but also to position themselves in, um, in a sometimes crowded market, but also in ways that are um, consistent uh, with their mission at first, but also that begin to transform their very mission that they um, that they serve. We know as well that marketing uh, higher education is a global phenomenon, that it is not isolated to um, any particular region of the world, but rather we can learn um, substantially from the competitive study of some of these marketing strategies that have become um, if not universal, if not universal, um, uh, they they certainly can be found in many different national contexts. But I also have been in, uh, interested in the type of ethical questions that come about in this process of marketing and branding in higher education. It is my conviction that. Um, as actors within universities, we are not passive. Um, well, we are no, never outside the system um, that we critique. I also believe that we have certain forms of agency, and one of them uh, involves engaging with the discourse um, of marketing, with the marketization itself of international education, but doing so not um, not in a way that rejects these processes, but rather in a way that engages with them with the intention of transforming them. Uh, I'm also uh, recognize, uh, recognizing um, that this position may come across as naive to some um, and that um, there would be some very uh, well-warranted skepticism toward these ideas that I am proposing. One of the manifestations of the marketization of international education is this idea that um, most higher education institutions recognize without apology, especially in, uh, in the global, uh, in the minority world, such as North America and Europe, that international students are a legitimate source of revenue that is intended to make up for public disinvestment in higher education. I really think this is a very important um, realization and something that we all should be confronted by. Furthermore, um, many of the activities that fall under the umbrella of internationalization today have to do 
with uh, revenue generation or are justified in terms that are connected with um, global markets. For example, educating for global citizenship is often presented as a legitimate goal of universities because universities are supposed to prepare students for a global uh, workforce. Uh, and therefore, it is a rather uncontroversial um, idea that universities need to, uh, first of all, serve the needs of this uh, global labor market and therefore um, that internationalization provides that possibility. Um, nevertheless, I think it's very important that each of us uh, explore different ways to transform these processes. Um, like I said earlier, not, um, not as a way of rejecting, but as a way of engaging with these arguments. And I really think um, that one way to do this could be imagining markets um, in different and alternative ways. I think we have come to um, some kind of uh, understanding of markets as involving global flows of capital, uh, the exploitation of natural resources primarily in um, the majority world. But this is not the only way to imagine uh, the markets. There are alternative ways to think about um, to think about markets, and that would include also thinking of markets as public spheres. Um, and I think this is why looking at history and the history of universities uh, is very important. The agora and the market are rather similar. They're both public spaces. They are spaces where people come across, they exchange in one ideas, they exchange products in the other case. And I really think that the metaphor of markets as an open space um, in my um, um, in my own experience, I think markets can be places of empowerment. The markets that I am thinking about as, um, as spaces for the exchange of, uh, of products, of things that we consider valuable. Um, and, and I really think this is very important. The word tianguis has been um, incorporated into, um, into Mexican Spanish. Uh, which is my native language. And I really think that idea of tianguis uh, helps me think about other ways to engage with the notion of markets, imagining, it, imagining them as spaces for people from different backgrounds coming together, um, imagining those spaces as uh, places where we don't only exchange things that we consider to be valuable, but also get to negotiate um, why and how valuable different products are. And I really think this idea of negotiation, contestation, um, and exchange, these values don't need to be associated necessarily with the neoliberal regime, but in fact, we can try to promote new and different understandings um, of, of these notions and ideas rather than rejecting them wholesale. As a result, I hope it will be possible for all of us to think about how this idea of negotiation, negotiating, setting um, or reinterpreting the value of things, but also understanding the significance of the encounter of people from different backgrounds and different uh, geographic uh, contexts can really be a set of values that inform the work in international education for the future.